What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? What's the purpose of it all? That's what we're discussing on this program each day. And uh, what we're beginning to talk about is the plan that the supreme being behind the universe had in mind when he made us and why he made us the way he did. And uh, one of the problems that many of us have in our own personal lives is the whole place of our emotions in our own life. We wonder to what extent our emotions should rule us, and yet we have real trouble controlling our emotions. We have great difficulty knowing exactly the place of the intellect in making decisions. We wonder at times whether our will should rule our minds or our minds should rule our will. Now, it's interesting that all those questions are brought together in some kind of synthesis when we begin to study the way the supreme being behind the universe made us. You remember we shared a few days ago the verse that is found, I don't know if you've ever looked at the old book of Genesis, we've all been so skeptical of it over the years that we probably have tended to commit it to the ash pit and regarded as pure myth, of course it's not at all. It's one of the most remarkable documents that we have in our world, and it has received the respect of more of our great minds down through the centuries than probably any other book. And it itself is so ancient that it is very believable that in fact the supreme being behind the universe did actually explain personally to Moses what had happened when he first made the world. So it is actually a very valuable book. But I'm not even going to try to justify it or defend it intellectually to you uh, in these talks. But I simply want you to examine uh, the explanation that is given there of our origin and just check out does it uh, confirm what we're experiencing in our own lives and does it throw any light on the answer to those questions that I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the place of the intellect or the place of the emotions in our personal lives. Anyway, the verse that we were looking at, if you have a Bible, you can look it up sometime at home. Uh, the way it's translated in the one I have is like this. It's Genesis chapter 2 and it's uh, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now forget uh, all the uh, photographic way that that is described. Don't forget that God, or the creator, was presenting this to mankind in mankind's childhood. Mankind has not always been brilliant at simultaneous equations. He has not always been excellent at how to operate Lotus 1, 2, 3 on the computer. He has not always been superb at working out a theory of relativity. So in the early days, he had all kinds of primitive ideas, and it is in the light of those ideas that God had to explain himself. So please don't get uppity and over-sophisticated about it. Uh, in fact, the heart of the reality of man is explained very well in that verse. The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. And actually, when some guy, uh, sooner or later, throws uh, some ashes on the top of your coffin or your casket and says, uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, earth to earth, uh, from earth you came and to earth you will return, and that's because, in fact, your body is made of dirt and earth and dust. And actually, if you go back to one of your grandparents' coffins and open it up, you'll probably see just a little heap of dust if it's been long enough. Because the body is worth, what did they say in the old uh, financial system, about seven and sixpence, and I don't know if it's worth a pound a day, but if you break down all the chemicals in your body and uh, melt it all down and sell it to somebody, you'll maybe get a pound for it. So it is true that uh, whoever made the world, and it seems that in fact the father of this man Jesus made the world, uh, whoever made the world, it is true that our bodies are made just of dust, they're made just of earth. So it's an indication that certainly this verse does not contradict the facts in that regard. And then you remember the verse goes on, and the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, um, it doesn't really matter 
Uh, it isn't a big deal whether he breathed it through our nostrils or breathed it through our mouths. Obviously, God explained it to mankind in his childhood in that way so that he would understand it, because presumably man in his childhood felt, uh, well, he breathed air through his nostrils. So God said, I breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. It wasn't, of course, just physical life. In fact, it's very interesting. The Hebrew word for breath there is the word ruach. And ruach uh, doesn't only mean breath or air or wind. It actually means spirit also. And uh, the intention of the verse is to show that the creator of the universe breathed into you and me his own spirit. Now, if you say, well, what's his own spirit? Well, partly it is what you say when you say, oh, he has a lovely spirit, hasn't he? He has a great spirit. Or you say, boy, Churchill had a great spirit, hadn't he? You mean it's the very essence of the man. He had a great attitude to life. He had a great uh, essence inside himself that was the very essence of him. When you talk about Churchill's spirit, you're saying what Churchill really was himself. That's probably what your spirit is. Your spirit is probably the real you. As we said a few days ago, what a man is when he is alone, that he is, and nothing more, that's probably you. That's your spirit. But it is interesting that the verse says the spirit of life, and actually the Hebrew word for life is lives. It's actually the spirit of lives. And so uh, the verse indicates that the creator of the universe breathed into this body the spirit of lives, not only kind of a spirit life, but also other lives as well. And you begin to see the meaning of that when you go to the last part of the verse, because it says, and man, as a result, became a living being. That's the Revised Standard Version translation, but the old King James is probably nearer to the Hebrew, because it says, and man became a living soul. And the Hebrew word is nephesh, and it means soul. And it's as if, you know, you, the Creator took the body from the dust breathed into it a spirit, and then those two combined and produced a soul. And the soul is in Greek, suke, and that becomes in our English language, psyche. And of course, that gives us our word psychology and psychological. And the soul is actually a psychological part of us, the mind and the emotions and the will. And man became a living soul. And so the explanation there given in back in Genesis is that we exist on three different levels. And that's why we're different from the animals. We have spirit inside us. As if, you know, your spirit is the real you, and round that you wear like a coat your soul or the psychological part of you, and round that you wear like a coat your body. So you actually operate on three different levels of consciousness. Your spirit is conscious of God, or can be. Your soul is conscious of yourself. It's the self-conscious part of you, the mind, emotions, and will. And the body is the part of you that is conscious through the five senses of the world and of the other people in it and the other things in it. So that is a very good outline of what you and I know to be our experience today. Because we would say, yeah, we do exist at those levels. We do exist at, at a physical level and at a mental and emotional and volitional level, and we do seem to exist at a spirit level also. And so that corresponds to what we have experienced. It is obvious that uh, we are all different in our experiences of those levels. Some of us who are what they would call in America jocks or sport types and uh, very physical types, uh, we are preoccupied with the body, preoccupied with the physical, and preoccupied almost with responding at a body level to almost everything. Uh, some of us are a little more mental. Maybe an Einstein is highly intellectual and exists to a great extent in the intellect. Maybe Horowitz or maybe Rubinstein live much more on the emotional level. Maybe some people with strong wills live on the volitional level. I don't know who lives exactly on the spirit level. Some spiritualists live on the spirit level, and we believe that it's possible for us ordinary people to live on the spirit level. But that is the general outline that is given there of the origin and the makeup of our personalities. Let's talk a little more about the maker's plan when he made us like that tomorrow.